This is a DG SNEC lecture on common retinal lasers. The scope of my talk today will include the timeout procedure, pen retinal photocoagulation, as well as focal laser. The timeout procedure involves both the patient performing the procedure and the witness. You have to make sure the patient is correct, use two patient identifiers, check that the eye is correct, check that the procedure is correct, and ask the patient if he or she knows what procedure he is undergoing. If you are using image-guided laser, check that the image on the computer is correct as well, and that you are using the correct lens. First, I'll talk about pen-retinal photocoagulation. Common indications for the procedure includes proliferative diabetic retinopathy, severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, ocular ischemic syndrome, as well as neovascular glaucoma. The procedure is simple. First, you anesthetize the eye, you use the quadrospheric or the superquadrospheric lens, or the mainster PRP lens. The type of laser you use is either the argon blue-green laser, or more commonly, we use the frequency doubled ND YAC 532 nanometers green laser in a Pascal scanning pattern. The settings we start with is usually 200 milliwatts, 200 milli microns, as well as 200 milliseconds. If you are using the Pascal laser, you usually start with 30 milliseconds. The end point is a grey burn. With regards to the coverage of the burn, it is usually superior and inferiorly away from the vascular arcades, temporarily 2 to 3 diameters away from the fovea, and nasally one third to half a disc diameter away from the disc. It should be one spot size apart. The no fly zone areas that you should not laser includes the disc, macula, any fibrovascular membranes, and areas with vitroretinal traction. The PRP can be done in one session or fractionated over two to three sessions. Some tips. You may laser a barricade around the no-fly zone and then laser anything that is per peripheral to your barricade. Or you can laser inferior retina before the superior retina in case the patient develops a vitreous hemorrhage in between your follow-ups. These are just some pictures and statistics of the three common lenses which are used for PRP. Next, we talk about the benefit, complications, and risk which is important when you counsel the patient for PRP. The benefit of the procedure to stabilize diabetic retinopathy, you tell the patient is able to pre prevent progression to PDR or tractional retinal detachment, about 50% decrease in the risk of severe visual loss. There are some risks associated with the procedure, such as decreased night vision, color vision, or dark adaptation. Usually, young patients will feel this more. Reduced visual feel, macular burn, some discomfort, loss of best corrected visual acuity, cystoid macular edema, or late aporetinal membrane formation. This is a picture of an ideal panretinal photocoagulation that is performed. Next up, we talk about focal laser. Common indications for focal laser include non center involving diabetic macular edema. You can use it to treat uh, diabetic macular edema as an adjunct to anti-VEGF therapy. Cystoid macular edema secondary to BRVO if the patient is contraindicated to anti-VEGF. Or certain age-related macular degeneration pathologies such as extrafoveal polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy or choroidal neovascularization. Less common indications include retinal artery macroaneurysms, retinal capillary hemangiomas, and peripheral lesions. The procedure is very similar to the panretinal photocoagulation procedure, except that in this case, you would choose a mainster focal grid lens or the Vogue area centralis lens. The laser machine is exactly the same. Settings is different. We usually aim for 100 milliwatts, 100 microns, and 100 milliseconds, and titrate to obtain a light gray burn or to blanch the microaneurysms. The important point is that you have to avoid the fovea. And how do you detect the fovea? You ask the patient to fixate on the light, on the laser light, to determine the foveal location. After which, 
Do not laser at the area which you have predetermined where the fovea is. To note, it may be difficult to locate on a diffuse swelling. So the no-fly zone for the first focal laser is 500 microns away from the center of the fovea, roughly about a one-third disc diameter. After the procedure, you would then see the patient in three months to reassess the amount of macular edema. This next slide is the modified ETDRS protocol for direct and grid photocoagulation for the treatment of diabetic macular edema. This shows the lens that we use for focal laser. Again, we have to explain to the patient regarding the benefit, complication and risk of the procedure. The benefit, reduce diabetic macular edema, stabilizes vision, prevent moderate and severe visual loss, and is also useful if patient is contraindicated to antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy, if there are financial concerns, if the patient's visual demands are low, or if the patient is unable to come back monthly for follow-up. The complications of the procedure includes burns to the macula, loss of best corrected visual acuity, scotoma, patient may feel discomfort, patient may have recurrence of diabetic macular edema, or rarely, sometimes you may get laser-induced CNV. This picture shows the right eye of the patient's macula, after which focal laser has been performed. 